Well, good morning, everyone. Um, Pauline, you're on your own up on the top there. Um, welcome to um, Siloam for this morning. We've got a guest speaker, Mr. Jim Probert, and he's so good that I'd recommend you coming back for the <laughs> evening service. And if he was doing three, I'd go for all three. Um, I'm supposed to be here giving notices, and I've had a word with Morrison, and he reckons that I can do this. Yeah, well, I'm not um, I'm, Look, there you go, welcome. So I've got the first bit right. Um, it's, it's lovely to see you all, um, genuinely. Um, evening service, six o'clock, and please, please, it's well worth coming in. Um, I can't, I can sing his praises enough, he's had enough praise now. Uh, and he's got to be humble for the, for the day, so. Move it, move it on, Morrison. What have we got? Oh, Bible studies. On a Tuesday at 7.15, we're looking at the storms of life coming at us in various forms um, through stories of storms in the Bible. So Paul shipwrecked off Malta. Um, he survived, but I don't think it was a great time for him. And if you want to come and just share some of your thoughts on the storms in, in life. This is a great opportunity to do it along with some biblical connection so you can see where God fits into that plan. Um, prayer meeting, Wednesday. Again, storms of life, but sometimes we've got things we need to just say thank you to God for. Um, as a church, um, that's, that's a family, that's a body um, that shares things in common. And we're here to encourage each other and also to share in our sorrows and our joys. Um, so prayer meeting Wednesday, 7.15. Um, forget me nots, even if you're not of an age where you have to go there or need to be there, um, pray. They're part of our community, the people who care for the elderly. Um, but think, think of the, the organisations within the church um, and the events and activities that, that we're connected with. Ladies Bible study, two o'clock on Fridays. Now, the next one up there is this thing on the 29th. And I, I don't do Welsh, but it's bilingual. So if you want a smattering of how to do a bit of Welsh, um, part of an international weekend, um, but on that Friday specifically, two o'clock, with tea, coffee, maybe Welsh cakes, highly speaking, that'd be fine. That weekend, um, just be part of it. Where you think, oh, I'll tell you what, I can come on down here and, and just enjoy some of what's happening over that weekend. Um, and again, pray. Because um, there you go, an international meal on Saturday night. That would be fun to go to. Who knows what nations we've got that can provide food. Are we moving on? Uh, right, 24th Communion, um, as I said to Morrison, that makes us fortnightly now, but that's just the way that the services are working out with people available and things happening. The food bank, you'll, you'll be aware that the prices are rising, that people are struggling, and um, if you've got the opportunity to be part of a loving community, um, go for it. It's not the only way you can show God's love to, to some of the people around us, but it's a great way of doing that. Um, if you've got a car and you're available to give somebody a lift, then why not? But if you don't know who needs a lift, or if you need a lift and you don't know somebody with a car, that's a connection you can make. Just talk to one of the deacons. I'm one of them, Mike Buckley, Morrison, um, Janet. I'm probably missing out on people here. Sue John's probably in the mix. But if you want a lift, or you can offer a lift, um, talk. Because I'm sure over the summer some people aren't going to be available that you'd normally rely on just to get to church. Um, and the Ukraine. It's an ongoing situation with, uh, I think it must be thousands, if not the best part of a million people displaced by now. And the very little that we can do um, goes a long way to people who are desperate and homeless, have got no, no stuff. Um, so the Romanian Aid Foundation, Romania on the border of Ukraine, 
where some of the refugees will be finding themselves in the first instance. The people that are there were already needing aid just as a country. Um, so to extend their, their love to other people is, is really quite special. Um, talk to Morrison again about that. Is there anything else, Morrison? He's nodding his head in a sort of negative way, so um, I'll leave you with um, Jim. Enjoy yourself. Thank you for your welcome. It's lovely to be with you this morning. Let's uh, just join up. Start our service by joining together in prayer, shall we? Father, we declare before heaven that this is the day that you have made. You have given it to us. We're grateful for it. Every breath that we breathe is a gift of, of God, and we say thank you. And we choose today to rejoice and be glad in it. We choose today to come and give you honour and to worship you. And we pray that from the very beginning our time together would be just that. A time when the name of Jesus is uplifted and honoured. We claim his promise. Because he said, where two or three gather in his name, he's there right in the middle. Where well, Lord, we're two or three. And we're gathering in his name. We know that. Therefore we claim that promise that in some wonderful way by the Holy Spirit we would encounter the risen Lord Jesus even this morning. From youngest to oldest we pray. That's the prayer. And it's offered in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to uh, stand to sing on this warm morning our first hymn, Light of the World. This is a, a lovely hymn by Tim Hughes. In fact, I, I've already thanked Morrison for his choice of, of hymns this morning. They probably three amongst my favourite. You, you know a song is a favourite when you're on your own and you, you burst into the song or you, you take a line from something and I have to say all these, these three, thi three hymns are featured in, in that respect. And this one in particular because light of the world, the singing of Jesus, and then the refrain, here I am to worship. I make in the choice. Here I am physically, but it's more than that, isn't it? It's my heart, Lord, touch my heart, that I might worship even the one who is light of the world. So let's stand and sing, light of the world.
worship, then it will be you know, praying for the world, then we'll narrow it down to our country, want to pray for the fellowship here, and then we'll pray together the Lord's, the Lord's Prayer. Father, those of us who have been able to sing those words from our heart, we just declare them again before heaven and say that we're here and we're here to worship. And we will never know the cost of what it means that we're allowed to come into your presence to offer our worship and our thanks. We'll, we'll never know what Jesus paid. We'll have some idea, I guess, but the enormity of that cross we won't understand it fully, I guess, but Lord, the bits that we understand, the bit that you, by your Spirit, have been able to see, we're just lost in wonder, and love, and worship, and we acknowledge this morning that it is right that he is exalted to your right hand. We acknowledge this morning it is right that the name of Jesus is the highest name in all of the universe and beyond, and we bow our knees in reverence this morning as we acknowledge him and as we prayed already we dare presume that this exalted one is pleased to be in the presence of his people and we just say thank you for that let that be our experience Lord we look down at this world or we look at the world you look down on it and oh Lord what a mess we continue to make man's anger ugliness hostility outrageous acts of wickedness against others and Lord oh Lord we think of Ukraine we think of other areas in the world where there is conflict and, and greed and wickedness and we just pray Lord that in your mercy you would look down and stop the wickedness of men we pray that there would be peace restored in Ukraine, we pray justice would be done you are the God of justice we believe that and we know one day when the Lord returns all will be made proper we know that but in the meantime, Lord, there's so much awfulness going on. Would you look on us with kindness and mercy and stop the hands of wicked men? We pray for our brothers and sisters right now. Whatever they might be in the globe who are being persecuted for their faith, be with them. Help them. Help them maintain strength and confidence in you. Think of our, our own man, Lord, that many years we've been blessed in so many ways, and yet look, look at us now. We're not proud. We're in need of your grace. Think of our little nation of Wales, Lord. We love it. Thank you for it. Would you smile again upon it? It's people that there would be a turning. Your spirit would touch the hearts of minds and women and boys and girls. That there would be a recognition of your Lordship. Pray for this fellowship here. Thank you for it. Thank you for its testimony over many years. Thank you for all its activities. Thank you for the love for you it clearly has. Just pray a blessing over it, Lord. Maintain it. Protect it. Those who will be with us this morning and can't for whatever reason, bless them too, we pray. We ask all these things in the name of the one who taught us while praying together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But thy name is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Thank you. Our, prayer, our reading this morning is, is just a short um, reading from Mark. It's Mark chapter 15. The crucifixion has just taken place, the Lord has just died, and it's verse 42 of Mark chapter 15. It was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. We call that Good Friday, of course. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for their kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. 
Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. We just do pray that the Lord will bless that reading to our hearts. And now a hymn that picks up, I guess, much of what we've just read and sung about already. It's when I survey the wondrous cross, that wonderful hymn of, of eyes of what, on which the Prince of Glory died. How can that be enough? Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, saving the death, saving the cross of Christ my God. These, it's deep theology in a beautiful tune and words put together. But again, if we can connect with our hearts, I think we'll express worship to our Father in heaven. So let's start to sing. When I survey the wondrous cross.
to meet this in our needs, whatever that might be this morning. Help us lift this to heaven itself as you have all day. Please help us. Amen. Amen. Sorry, I guess I'm the only one who has the option to go <laughs> It does get very warm up here, just to let you know. <laughs> the story is told of a young man who played in North America. He is an American football player. And he played in the uh, college system, which is very big in the States. He was never quite good enough to make the first team. He was, he was very conscientious. He turned up to every training session. They, but in the reserves now and again, but he was never quite good enough to make the first team. He was a coach's dream because he never complained. He was always there, training, always gave his all, but he never quite had it. He was never quite good enough. The coach was aware that sometimes when the, the lad played, there was a, a man there watching, so he guessed it was his dad, but nevertheless, he was very surprised and saddened when the young man came to him on one occasion and said, Coach, I'm not going to be able to train for a few weeks. My, my father has died suddenly and I need to be away and sort things out. And the coach, of course, fully understood. You, you do what you need to do. You take your time. And he expressed his commiserations. A couple of weeks later, the young man was back in training. He was ever full, fully committed, totally committed to the training session. Never quite good enough. At the end of the session, he went to the coach and said, coach, you've got a game on Saturday, haven't we, the first team? Yes, says the coach, that's right. The young man said, I've never asked you this before, but put me in the team. Put me in the team. And the coach said, man, I love you. I love your attitude. I love your commitments. But you know as well as I do, you're not quite good enough. I can't, in all honesty, Ask someone else to stand down and make way for you. I'm sorry. The young man said, I know that coach, he said, but put me in the team. If I'm not the best player after 10 minutes, just take me off. Well, the coach put him in the team. And you can kind of guess what's coming. He wasn't the best player after 10 minutes. He was the best player after the whole game. No one had seen him play like this at all. The man who he'd replaced said to the coach, you did the right thing putting him in. At the end, the coach went up to the young man and said, wow, what a game, he said, was, was that for your dad? Well, said the young man, kind of. You see, my dad was blind. And today is the first time he's seen me play. <laughs> and I played for him. Now, listen, I, I don't want to discuss the theology of other people who died. So that, that's not the point. The point is this. If you think something, if you believe something, it influences what you do. It's right, isn't it? If you think something, believe something, it influences what you do. Jesus said that the overflow of the, of the heart, the mouth speaks. And we're going to consider someone who thought something of Jesus. Because in the end, what you think of Jesus will influence how you are, your whole life. And we're going to consider someone who had a certain view of Jesus and who acted upon it. First, I want to share a story that I shared in 2014 from this place. And if you remember it while you were here, <laughs> and secondly, well done, you, you remember it. Um, but it does fit with what I hope to say over the next few minutes. It was, um, our lad, yeah, our eldest boy was six and he'd just gone to a birthday party and he was held in something called Jungle Gym's Jumping Bonanza. It sounds very really grand, and it was. It, it, it used to be, well, well laser zone is now, so it's in Park Tower. That's where it was, and the party was amazing. Laser, uh, in Jungle Gyms, Jumping Bonanza, they were climbing frames and trampolines and board balls, and it was everything a six year old would want. So, as he left, you know, full of the joys of a wonderful party, the party finished the way all parties should finish uh, with, with a party bag, and also, as a special bonus, a gas filled balloon, a balloon on the end of a piece of string. What a way to finish a party. As they're filing out of Jungle Gyms, Jumping Bonanza, the little girl in front let go of a piece of string and the gas-filled balloon did what gas-filled balloons do, it floated up. And the ceiling wasn't quite as high as this ceiling, but it was quite a high ceiling. And the mother the, the, the of the little girl turned to the, the tracksuit clad jungle gym assistants and, and they jumped and, and tried it, couldn't get it. 
you might begin to see where this is heading. And in desperation, she kind of turned to me. I was next in line, and I jumped, and of course, I missed it. Uh, but I had a, a second go, and, and whether there was a gust of wind from somewhere, but I kid you not, I, I hung mid-air, like Alan Wynne Jones, and I, I was able to get the piece of string, and I returned at the little girl. There was kind of applause from the parents who were around. Um, my little boy's face, while his jaw was just, uh, it took me agape, and I, I must admit, I, I felt quite pleased with myself. That's one of the reasons I'm telling the story now, if I'm really honest. But as we left, then to go to the car park, park tower, I felt something I hadn't felt for a while. My six-year-old had come to the conclusion that being seen in public, holding hands with your dad, was not a cruel thing to do. And on this occasion, I felt his hand reach for mine. <laughs> and I knew what he was saying. He was saying, Dad, it doesn't happen very often. <laughs> But you've done something, and I don't mind on this occasion, who knows that we belong together. <laughs> we like to be associated with winners. We like to be on the winning sides. And we like to dissociate ourselves from failure. You know the Max Boyce story? He might have been about six. I'm not sure whether it was a nationalised effort, but it was an ice effort. He learned, oh well, well, a squirrel, oh well, well. And he's on the stage, oh well, well. And he says, that's all he could remember. <laughs> Everything else was gone. And his mum's in the audience, and someone next to his mum says, hey, Mrs. Boyce, isn't that your Max up there? And apparently she said, no, she said, I've never seen him before in my life. <laughs> we like to be on the winning side. We like to be linked with success. And we like to avoid the thought that we're the losers. It's part of our makeup. And that is why I am drawn to people who make a stand even though it seems to be a silly one, or one that's against the flow, or one that's going to invite ridicule, or one that just seems to be plain wrong. I, I, I admire those people. I, I admire this young man called Daniel Yoroth, who sadly died at the age of 15. Daniel Yoroth was the son of Terry Yoroth, former uh, Wales manager. He managed the Swans, managed Cardiff City. They played in his time as well. His young son died suddenly of a rare heart disease. Daniel Yoroth, younger brother of Gabby Logan, the excellent, I think, TV presenter. Terry Yoroth was devastated by the awful, awful news, and he wanted people to know the kind of young man his son was. He said, I'll tell you a story about my son, so you'll know how he, what the kind of man he was. It was the day after Wales had gone to Eastern Europe, and I think we lost 5-0, it was the, the bad old days, and so things had, had not gone well. Terry Arthur lived in Leeds at the time, so they obviously had flown back, and the next day, as Terry Arthur was kind of licking his wounds, I guess, uh, Daniel's son shouted goodbye as he went off to college in Leeds. And as he looked out the window, Terry Arthur noticed that his son was wearing the full Wales tracksuit. And Terry Arthur said, look, this is Leeds. This is a few hours after Wales had taken a real hammering. That man was going to get all kinds of ridicule and banter and unkind comments that day. Terry Roth was saying, that my dad was saying, Dad, it's your team. And I don't care what happens to me today, it's your team and I stand with you. And that's the kind of young man he is. I am impressed, here's the point, with those people who make a stand, even though it's not a popular one, even though it appears to be associated with defeats. It's why I am incredibly impressed with Joseph of Arimathea. We read about him. I am drawn to this man. You know, we don't know an awful lot about Joseph of Arimathea, and yet here's a remarkable thing. It's rare in Scripture, certainly in the Gospels. He is mentioned in all four Gospels, and he's mentioned by name, and the same incident is recorded in all four. We don't hear about him before, and we don't hear about him after. It's almost as if there's a movie, and he comes on and does his thing, and then goes and we never hear about him again. And yet it must be clearly important because every single one of the gospel writers refer to it. And they all refer to him by name. This is a big thing that he does. And although all four gospel writers refer to him, they only, like Mark, talk about what he does in four or five verses. It's only a small little bit that we have. If we piece all the accounts together, we, we know that he's a wealthy man because he's just bought the tomb. 
He's an influential man because he's a member of the Sanhedrin, the, the Jewish ruling council. So he's part of the, the ruling elite, if you like, the establishment. So he's a man of prestige and position as well as wealth. Oh, and we also know he's a disciple of Jesus. John gives this detail. He says he was a secret disciple because he feared the Jews. So here's a man, Joseph. He's, he's an influential man, a wealthy man, a significant man. He's a follower of Jesus, but he's keeping it quiet because, well, he's got a lot to lose. Let's be honest. If they go for the main man, they're, they're going to go for his followers afterwards, sure as eggs. He's got a lot to lose. We know what he does, which is quite beautiful. He goes boldly up to Pilate and asks for the body. So he was there at the crucifixion, and the body is taken and placed in his own to all four gospel writers I repeat, refer to this story. A secret disciple. But he's not a secret disciple anymore. Not now he's boldly gone to Pilate. Not now in full view of everyone. He's taken the body and cared for it. His secret has been kept, but it's now out in the open. And you're thinking, why? Why now? You see, I think Joseph thinks it's all over. I, I, I don't think he anticipates resurrection. You don't kind of give you two up if you think it's not going to be used for long. And I think he thinks it's all over. And, and yet, at this moment, he boldly goes to Pilate. All of a sudden, his secret is a secret no more. Imagine his enemies rubbing their hands with glee. He's a politician. He'll have had enemies. And they're rubbing their hands with glee. The fool! We've got him now. We've always had our suspicions. But we can go for him now. We've got this, the main man. Now we're going to go for some of his followers. The fool. He's let the cat out of the bag. We'll get him now. Imagine his friends. Joseph. Just don't do it. It's a secret. We didn't know. We're not telling anyone. Your secret is safe with us. Look, it's a shame. You backed the wrong man. It happens. You thought he was Messiah. Well, clearly he wasn't because this is not what happens to Messiah. You, you, you made a mistake. You, and for, it happens. Keep your head down. No one need know. Your secret is safe with us, kind of thing. But no. Joseph, at this moment of apparent defeat, boldly goes up to Pilate and asks for the body. I, repeat, I think he thinks it's all over. I don't think for one minute he realizes, this is a wonderful thing, I don't think for one minute he realizes that he is helping fulfill a remarkable prophet, prophecy written 700 years before. Isaiah, Isaiah 53, says this of, of the Lord's suffering servant. He says, he will be a sign of grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. The prophecy is of the, the suffering servant that will lie with the rich in his death. Well, how on earth is that going to happen? This man hasn't got two pennies to rub together. He says that the foxes have got holes, the birds of the air have got the nests. The son of man has no place to lay his head. He, he's got nothing. How on earth is he going to lie with the rich in his death? Well, this is how. By Joseph fulfilling a prophecy. I don't think he has a clue what that's going on. That, but that means the significance of it. But, but here it is. I don't, I think he thinks it's all over. I don't realize, I don't think he realizes he's helping fulfill prophecy. So why is he doing it? And why is he doing it now? I think there's only one conclusion. And it's this. He loves it. Joseph of Arimathea loves Jesus of Nazareth. I don't think there's any other conclusion we can come to. At this moment of risk and of apparent defeat, he loves him. He loves him. And people will do what they think or what they believe about someone. And here, in this amazing act, he demonstrates his love for Jesus. And I've got to say that for me, it's very challenging. Because Joseph reminds us really that when all is said and done, we can complicate things as much as we like, and we do, and we love to do so. When all is said and done, what counts 
is loving Jesus. You can have a doctorate in theology. You can be the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Bishop of Rome. What counts is whether you love Jesus of Nazareth. Bottom line. Remember Peter denied Jesus three times. And Jesus, because with Jesus there's always a way back. Jesus reinstates him in John chapter 21 and has the conversation with Peter. And you remember, he asks him three times to match the three denials. He says three times. You remember what he says. Three times. Of all the things he could say, of all the deep theology he could discuss, of all the significance of what wants to come he could talk about, he says three times this. Do you love me? He says. Do you love me? Do you love me? When all is said and done, Joseph reminds us, when all is said and done, Bottom line, do you love him? Your theology can be brilliant. Your heart can be as cold as ice. Your theology might be a little bit off. Do you love him? Bottom line, Joseph reminds us of that. And Joseph does something else. He shows us what loving Jesus looks like. You see, it's not just something that we internalize. It's not a, a gooey feeling, is it? I mean, feelings are part of it for sure. But it leads to action, agape, sacrificial love. That, whole idea of, of choice and Joseph shows us what loving Jesus looks like because it's bold and it's brave it doesn't count the cost it takes a risk and Joseph does all these things he's bold he doesn't count the cost to himself I don't care what happens to me I will not have that body spoiled anymore that's what he does this act of love I don't care what happens to me I will not have that one spoiled anymore and he cares for him and he takes a risk because he might have trouble ahead. And his love is selfless. Love for Jesus is all these things. But of course it reminds us that his love for us is all these things too. Because his love for us is bold and brave. No one braver in the history of humanity. Never courage seen like we witness in Gethsemane. A few days before Jesus realizes what's coming, it's the, a few days before the cross, and he says, My heart is troubled, my soul is disturbed within me. He, he knows what's coming. And he says, What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, he says, it was for this hour I, I came. So he, he says, I'm going to pray to be saved. No, and yet a few nights later, that's exactly what he prays. Father, save me from. There could be another way. Come to that place of sacrifice and of courage and of yielding, Father. Your will be done. Never courage like this man. Never love as courageous as this love. And his love doesn't count the cost. Jesus said, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom. For many, paying as a price to pay, you know that? Peter says, you know it's not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed, bought back. No, it was with the precious blood of Christ. I've shared with you before how I get nervous and Saturday morning in Tesco and it's time to pay for the groceries and it's all on cards isn't it, these days and get nervous because you know it's going to work, expect the, the doors to lock, the police, the sirens, stop that man kind of thing. And ironically, my car didn't work <laughs> yesterday. The contactless stuff, it, it wasn't working, so I had to put in, use the pin. Of course, I haven't used the pin for such a long time. And, oh, it's stress until two words appear on the computer. Transaction completes. Transaction completes. Whew, off to the car before they change their minds. Three words. It is finished. Transaction complete. Price, sin, whole world is taken on this man's shoulders and it is complete, it is done, dear friends. You know that this morning, don't you? Those of you who struggle with, with sin, sin is dealt with. I know we have the business of holy living, absolutely, but even then we can in confession before him. Because of the cross, his love doesn't count the cost. He thinks we're worth it. We might disagree, but his opinion is fixed. We're worth it, so. His love doesn't count the cost. It's bold and it's brave. 
And his love takes an incredible risk. It seems strange to talk about God in this way, but God loves the world, we know that, and yet he knows. But in our freedom of spirit, by and large, we, we turn away. He came to his own, says the scripture. His own received him not. He knows that full well, but he comes anyway. And to those who did receive, he gave the right to become children, sons and daughters of the living God. He's outside Jerusalem, isn't he? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks. But you were not willing. You see, love can't impose itself, can it? I can't force you to love me. It doesn't work that way. Love makes itself vulnerable. Even God's love makes itself vulnerable. And Jesus' love, just as Joseph made himself vulnerable, Joseph just... The love of Jesus, likewise, is vulnerable in this sense. We can accept or we can reject, and you know that most will reject. Still he loves. Still he's seeking the lost. His love takes that risk. And just like Joseph's love is selfless, so the love of Jesus to us is selfless. As Paul in Philippians, he made himself nothing, taking the nature of a servant, he humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. His other selfless is not about him, it's all about us. And therefore, says Philippians 2, God has exalted him to the highest place. And we say amen to that. The love of Jesus is bold and it's brave. It doesn't count the cost, it takes a risk. It is selfless. And I find it utterly compelling. You do know, don't you, that he's not ashamed of you. You know, Gav was a little bit awkward at six that he's seen with me, but he's not ashamed of you. He knows you through and through, yet he's happy to stand with you. He knows the hairs on your head. They called him the friend of sinners. And they meant that was a real insult, didn't they? It was, don't, don't you know the kind of people you're mixing with? Don't you know the, the kind of woman she is? The kind of man he is? The tax bank, the prostitute, whatever else it might be? Call yourself a religious man? Good gracious me. Don't you know who you're with? Oh, he knew full well who he was with. That's why he came. And the friend of sinners, which has meant a great insult to many of us over the hundreds of years, has been a great consolation. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're not ashamed to call yourself my friend. He's not ashamed of us. It's, it's not to make light of our sin. It's to make everything of the cross is what the cross is all about. So Joseph Mann, he reminds us that when all is said and done, it's about loving Jesus. You can complicate it as much as you want. It's whether you love him. And Joseph reminds us that the, the love that Jesus has for us, it's just so amazing. It's bold and it's brave and it's selfless and it takes a risk and it doesn't count the cost. But Joseph inevitably leaves us with this question. We can't, we can't duck it. We can't avoid it. You see, I see Joseph and he asks me, do you love him too? And friend, that's the question to my heart to you this morning. Do you love him? Do you love him? Do you love him boldly? It takes courage sometimes. Do you love him selflessly, putting others first? Do you love him without counting the cost? Do you love him taking a risk? It's easy to become guilty at this moment, actually, because we all know the warmest of us with hearts that are flame. We all know we don't love him enough. We, we know that. It's easy to slip into guilt. Teresa of Avila says this, God, she prays, I don't love you, I don't want to love you, but I want to, want to love you. Do you see what she's saying? She's saying, Lord, I'm starting from a very low base, I know that. Move me on, move me closer, help me. And I think God will do something with a prayer like that. We all know our deficiencies of love. Absolutely. Lord, move us, move us closer. C.S. Lewis very helpfully said, I think, he says, don't, and worry and jewelry. Don't spend too long self-analyzing. Do I love Jesus? Do I love Jesus and Nazareth? He says, do what someone would do if they did love him. 
You see this agape love, this is action love, this is choice love. Do what someone would do if they did love him. Remember, what you think of someone influences what you do. If you know his love for you, if you touch that grace and experience of his love, poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, you will love him by the things that you do. I, I don't think for any of us that would involve taking a body down from a place of execution. I don't think so. I do think it will mean giving a cup of water to a thirsty person. I do think it will mean giving a loaf of bread to someone who's hungry. I do think it will mean welcoming a stranger in. I do think it will mean caring for the sick. I certainly believe it means you will forgive those who are opposed to you and who have hurt you and who have harmed you. And I think it will mean praying and loving your enemies, those who hate you. That's what he said people will do if they love me, obey my commands. And you will love each other, you will worship. Let me remind you of the minister on Chestnut Street. A minister on Chestnut Street, Philadelphia, USA, noticed a homeless man coming towards him. He was filthy in his beard, was caked with rotten food. He was holding a cup of coffee and the lip of the cup was dirty. Standing up to him, the tramp exclaimed, Hey, mister, you want some of my coffee? The pastor really didn't, but he thought it was the right thing to do, so he said, Sure, I'll take a sip. When he handed the cup back, he remarked, You're generous giving away your coffee. Looking at him, the tramp replied, Well, it was particularly delicious today, and I think if God gives you something that good, you should share it. The pastor continued, I figured I was being set up, and it would cost me five bucks. So I asked him, is there something I can do for you in return? The man answered, yeah, you can give me a hug. To tell the truth, said the pastor, I was hoping for the five dollar option. <laughs> he put his arms around me and suddenly I realized he wasn't going to let me go. People were passing by and staring at me. There I was, dressed in my establishment guard, hugging this filthy tramp. I was embarrassed. Then little by little, my embarrassment changed to awe. I heard a voice echoing down the corridors of time saying, I was hungry, did you feed me? I was naked, did you clothe me? I was sick, did you care for me? I was the tramp came out on Chestnut Street, did you hug me? Or if you did, you did it to me. Loving Jesus in the end isn't just a matter of the heart, it starts there. It overflows into action. What I think of him, what I think of anyone, influences the way that I live. Joseph of Arimathea, I repeat, you might correct me one day, but I think he thinks it's all over. And yet still, that act of love is incredible. We know better than Joseph. We know it was just beginning. How much more, therefore, should our lives display the love of the risen Christ to those around us? Father, Thank you for this man, Joseph. Thank you for the example he gives us. Thank you for the love the Lord Jesus has for us. Pray this morning, Lord, and we need your Holy Spirit's help here. It's beyond our imaginings, it's beyond our understanding. We, we, we understand that, can't we? But by your Holy Spirit's touch, help us know, help us receive something of the love of Christ for us, that we might love others in return. Thank you, Lord, for whatever we give to you, first we declare, you loved us. Help us love you, we pray. I pray for my brothers and sisters, this might be their experience as we seek to give honour and glory to the one that we love, even in Jesus, Christ the Lord. Amen. 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 <coughs> Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. We love thee as we sing our final hymn. That we could make that an expression of our hearts as we Seek to live for him, who first, of course, loves, loves us. Thank you.
fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with us now and evermore. Amen.